So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Trauma and Literature, where we start with a new text today. It's Catherine Mansfield's short story, The Fly. We just finished looking at two short stories by her, Sada Hassan Mondo, which were uh, Toba Te Singh and Cold Meat. And today we start with a new story uh, with a new cultural uh, backdrop, which happens to be First World War. <clears throat> so Mondo's stories were about partition, the 1947 partition between India and Pakistan, and the violence which was uh, perpetrated by the partition. And this particular story, <clears throat> the backdrop, as I just mentioned, is First World War. But it's a very different kind of violence which is being enacted over here. It's not so much about physical violence, it's about more a psychological violence. And trauma becomes a very interesting category in the story. It becomes almost, uh, so to speak, a performative category. So trauma has been performed. And um, in a very bizarre way, it's a very strange and, and complex story, but in a very bizarre way, there is some equation which is established in this narrative between trauma and privilege. In other words, uh, trauma becomes an ability in some sense. You know, you're able to feel traumatized, you're able to perform trauma. And this ability is connected to a sense of privilege uh, in a sense that you, you seem to have some ownership on your trauma. Uh, it is your trauma and it's more, it's, it's darker, it's more wounding, it's more grieving, it's more, it's more of a loss compared to other people's trauma. Uh, so trauma becomes, in a way, uh, a category of agency. Uh, trauma becomes a marker of agency, a marker of privilege. Uh, you know, and that differentiates uh, one particular traumatic person from the other people. You know. And so the whole idea in the story is about the hubris or the false pride uh, which someone, an individual has in terms of being able to have ownership on his own trauma, in terms of having, uh, you know, connecting trauma with privilege, in terms of uh, you know this this equation between trauma and individuality, right? So uh, the protagonist in the story is a person called Boss. Uh, it's never named in the whole story, which is obviously quite symbolic because uh, the whole idea of the boss there is a degree of uh, uh, hegemonic masculinity about the uh, the character. So he wants to be the hegemonic male. He he wants to be the dominant male in this whole story in this whole narrative. Uh, and the way of establishing his dominance, uh, among other ways, is also uh, the ability to feel traumatized uh, at any given point of time. So trauma, as I mentioned, becomes an ability, it becomes a marker of agency, it becomes a marker of uh, privilege, uh, hegemonic masculine privilege. Right, so, and interesting, this story uh, is also very complex because normally, as we know, the whole idea of hysteria uh, is seen as a female malady, the very sexist definition of hysteria, uh, as a female malady, something which happens only to women, a woman are hysteric more naturally. But over here in the story, hysteria becomes a performative category that I'm able to feel hysteric because I'm so manly. So in a way, it becomes an interesting equation between masculinity and hysteria, right? So your, your masculinity, your, your privileged masculinity, your hegemonic masculinity is so determined by your ability to be hysteric. So hysteria becomes an ability, hysteria becomes a marker of agency, masculinity, privilege. Uh, so you know, in that sense, it becomes a, a retelling uh, of the hysteric narrative, the dominant stereotypical hysteric narrative. So the, the boss in the story, uh, he wants hysteria to become a performative category. He wants to perform uh, hysteria at will. Uh, he wants to be able uh, to feel traumatized at will. He wants to perform trauma at will. So that there lies his, uh, you know, the, the privileged masculinity that he wants to embody. So his privilege as a male, the, the fact that he's a privileged male is determined by his ability to be hysteric at any given point of time. Uh, his privilege as a male is determined by his ability to feel traumatized at any given point of time. And that, that really makes the story very complex and bizarre at many levels. So the strangeness in the story is about how trauma becomes a male category. It becomes a male commodity to a certain extent. That, you know, I'm able to uh, acquire trauma. I'm able to have ownership on my own trauma. It's my property. It's my personal property. So this commodification of trauma, this commodification of hysteria, uh, when it becomes a commodity owned by a man uh, becomes interesting because at the very beginning of the story we have this idea of ownership coming in. Uh, the boss is sitting in his own office, he, is, uh, he owns a lovely office, he owns all the gadgets around him, uh, he owns the capital that flows inside the office. So in, a, in that sense uh, trauma also becomes part of the uh, commodity economy. Uh, in this particular narrative where he, he owns trauma, he wants to own trauma as well, he own, wants to own time as well. Right? So the whole idea of owning time, then the fact that you know, time can have no effect on me because I own it, 
I can go back to the original hysteric moment, I can go back to the original traumatic moment and own it and replay it uh, very performatively. So that also becomes an idea of ownership, an experience of ownership, which is established in the story and equated with the idea of hegemonic dominant masculinity. Right, so that's the, uh, uh, the, the theoretical framework we'll be looking at while reading The Fly by Cathy Mansfield. And of course, uh, <clears throat> the, whole, the whole hegemony of the boss is, is established by uh, contrasting characters, uh, characters who are not hegemonic. Uh, there's a character called Old Woodyfield, he's always old, he's always senile, he's always decadent, although he is biologically younger than the boss. Uh, there's a character of Macy, uh, the office errand person for the boss. He runs and does errands for him. Uh, obviously, he's, he's a faithful, loyal servant uh, whose whole idea, whose whole presence is there. Uh, to establish the boss's dominance. Uh, and there's also um, the other male, the, the spectral male, the dead male, uh, boss's own son, right, who was being killed in the war, First World War, who's, who's lost was such a greedy moment for the boss that that grief, that mourn, uh, the mourning, the idea of mourning, he, he wants to perpetrate it. So in, a, in that sense, it becomes a, a very interesting equation between masculinity and mournability. So you know, the mournable subject is a masculine subject and the subject is mourning is also male, right? So the whole idea of the absent female becomes important. There's no reference at all to the boss's wife. There's no reference at all uh, to the dead son's mother. Uh, she's just uh, a conspicuous absence in the story. Uh, and the only woman we get to know about are what if you will's wife and daughters uh, who interestingly have more agency at a practical level, at a social level than Woodyfield. I mean, they traveled to Belgium to take a look at the old son's grave. Uh, they determine where he should leave the house. They decide on his appearance. They decide on what day of the week he's supposed to go out and come back. So they, they seem to be in control. So this uh, very interesting equation between masculinity, privilege, uh, the absent female, hysteria, uh, moanability, uh, that all these make the story very gendered in quality. So it's a very complex story to take a look at from a gender studies perspective as well. Uh, and also, obviously, it's um, a story about trauma, but interestingly, it becomes, in a way, it deconstructs trauma in a way which makes it performative. So trauma, normally we, we associate trauma with uh, loss, or normally we associate trauma with the inability, but trauma over here becomes obviously loss, but that loss also has the equations of ownership as the boss's own loss. He wants to own it like no one else does. Uh, he wants to own it to the extent that it stays forever fresh in his mind. It's like a commodity. It's like I, I, I purchased something. I don't want to make sure that this, that stays fresh, fresh all the time. That whenever I consume it, it stays fresh all the time, right? So the whole idea of uh, mournability and commodification becomes interesting in the story. So that being the uh, uh, backdrop, that being the, the theoretical framework which we'll use. And as I mentioned, you know there are woman characters, uh, very interestingly absent. The boss's wife is never present, and all the characters, female, who are present in the story. Uh, Woodyfield's uh, wife and daughters, who, as I mentioned, uh, they sort of decide on Woodyfield's appearance, they make decisions, they travel, they have more mobility than Woodyfield, etc. Okay, so uh, let's dive into the story, which should be on your screen. Uh, this is the fly by Captain Mansfield. Uh, so here goes. <clears throat> You're very snug in here, piped all with Mr. Woodyfield, and peered out of his great green leather armchair by his friend, the boss's desk, as a baby peers out of his pram. So the very first sentence is very loaded. Uh, so you're very snug in here, you're very comfortable in here. What do you feel is saying? Uh, to whom? The boss. And how is Woody Fool situated? Uh, he's situated, he's sitting in a great leather armchair, green leather armchair, by his boss. Uh, the boss is sitting on the desk. But uh, Woody Fool is piping out the sentence and he's appearing as if as a baby you know, peering out of a pram. So at the very opening sentence, we have this example of infantilization. So Woodyfield is infantilized. He, he's been cut into a child. He, he appears as a child. His embodiment is an embodiment of infantilization. So he's like a baby peering out of the pram and talking to the boss. His talk was over. It was time for him to be off, but he did not want to go. Since he had retired, since his stroke, the wife and the girls kept him boxed up in the house every day of the week except Tuesday. Uh, so again, we have this idea <coughs> of the uh, paralyzed male. He has suffered a stroke. Uh, he obviously has medical health problems and he's also retired. So in, in every which way, he doesn't have any agency anymore. He's retired, so presumably he doesn't earn anymore. 
uh, he has had a stroke, which, so presumably he doesn't have much control over his own body anymore. So ever since his uh, you know, financial agency and his biological agency have been uh, you know, exhausted, compromised, dwindled, uh, his wife and the girls uh, decide to pull, uh, you know, they, they, they control uh, him. So they keep him in his house, boxed up in the house. Uh, so box stuff obviously becomes a metaphor of confinement. So he's going to find the house all the time. He's put in the house, uh, stored in the house all the time. He's not allowed to leave the house at all except Tuesday. So on Tuesdays he was dressed and brushed and allowed to cut back to the city for the day. So again, if you take a look at the sentence closely, he was dressed up and brushed. So they, they dress him up, they brush his hair and they allow him to go out. So again, the very, very infantilizing metaphors. So you dress up a child, you, you brush the hair of a child, you allow a child to go and have a good time. So the whole idea of agency becomes uh, uh, immediately interesting in the story. So he is uh, he's allowed by uh, his wife and daughters to get dressed up, they dress him up, they, they brush his hair, they let him go out and have a good time etc. Which obviously means they control his decisions, they control his mobility, they control his movement. Okay? Uh, though what he did then, uh, the wife and the girls couldn't imagine. Uh, made a nuisance of himself to his friends, they supposed, right? So they didn't all know what to do, what he did. Maybe he had a, uh, he, he messed up his friends, he made a nuisance of himself to his friends, he was an embarrassment perhaps. Well, perhaps so. All the same, we cling to our last pleasures as a tree clings to its last leaves. So again, this metaphor, this uh, botanical metaphor is interesting. What it feels like a tree losing its leaves? Uh, and he wants to cling on to his last pleasures, uh, like a tree would want to cling on, presumably, to its last leaves. Uh, so the idea of a dying man becomes important. The, the, the idea of an infantilized man, a man who's lost his agency, a man who's uh, lost his mobility, the man who doesn't really have much of a choice in terms of his lifestyle, uh, becomes uh, interesting. And the, the metaphor, the connect is botanical and quality. Right, okay. <clears throat> so there's that old Willie Field, uh, smoking a cigar, and staring almost greedily at the boss, who rolled in his office chair, stout, rosy, five years older than him, and still going strong, still at the helm. So we are told that biologically speaking, the boss is five years older than Winterfield, and still, despite that, despite the biological uh, seniority, he is still strong, he is still at the helm, so he still controls things, he is in control. Uh, and he's obviously stout and rosy, he's in good health, despite his age, uh, still going strong, still at the helm. It did one good to see him, right? So what do you feel feels good about seeing the boss? At least there's some kind of a wish fulfilling fantasy that if I can't be as strong, as stout, as rosy, at least someone else is, and someone else is in control, uh, unlike me. <clears throat> okay. Wistfully, admiringly, the old voice added, "It's snug in here, upon my word. It's so comfortable in here. You have a very comfortable office, upon my word." Yes, it's comfortable enough, agreed the boss, and he flipped his Financial Times with a paper knife. So again, um, you have to be very careful about the movements in the story. The boss is flipping open his Financial Times with a paper knife. So first of all, the presence of Financial Times is a very, very masculine newspaper. It's about money, it's about capital, it's about economy. Uh, and obviously this is written in a time where women had very limited access to these things. It's mostly a male controlled domain when men have access to all these things. So you know, he's reading the Financial Times, which is about the financial situation in Europe at that time, maybe it's in its own country. But essentially it's about the capital and it's about the, you know, this is a time where men control the capital, male control, the men have almost a monopoly on the capital. So he's reading the Financial Times obviously makes him, uh, strongly situates them in that capitalist framework, this male capitalist framework. And he uh, flips it open with a paper knife, again a very phallic instrument, a paper knife. Uh, that instrument obviously becomes, uh, the motor movement of opening the Financial Times with a paper knife obviously becomes a marker of mobility, a marker of agency, a marker of masculinity. Uh, he's flipping open the Financial Times with a paper knife. So the motor movement itself is symbolic uh, of his agentic movement as a strong uh, agentic male. Okay, so uh, yes, it's comfortable enough, agreed the boss, uh, and he flipped his Financial Times with a paper knife. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he was proud of his room. He liked to have it admired, especially by old Woodyfield. It gave him a feeling of deep, solid satisfaction to be planted there in the midst of it, in full view of the frail old figure in the muffler. So again, look at the way the contrasts are played out in the story. The boss wants to be admired. The boss wants his uh, uh, office to be admired, and it gave him a lot of satisfaction, uh, almost narcissistic satisfaction, to be admired uh, almost greedily by old Winterfield. 
And Woodyfield, of course, is described as a frail old figure in the muffler. He's almost like a zombie. He's almost like a, you know, he doesn't have any substance left. He's like a mummy, uh, you know, walking around. Uh, and this mummification of Woodyfield is important. It's like he's, he's hollowed out entirely. Uh, there's, no, there's no substance left. There's a frail old figure in the muffler. It's like a, a hollow man, a straw man. Uh, anyone can, you know, blow him off to pieces. He's like, you know, a completely decadent. And that decadence of Woodyfield, that hollowness of Woodyfield is compared and contrasted, obviously, with the boss's own stoutness, the boss's own solidity, right? And that solidity becomes, obviously, a marker of masculinity uh, in the story. <clears throat> so it gave me a lot of pleasure to be admired uh, so heavily by Woodyfield, uh, the frail old figure in the muffler, as we are told. I've had it done up lately, he exclaimed, as he had explained for the past how many weeks. New carpet, so now he's going to show off his new gadgets, his new commodities, his new markers and masculinities, new possessions, right? Uh, so we're told that he has had the office done up, repaired, renovated lately. And also this whole lot of renovation becomes interesting, which means he's uh, very keen uh, to renew himself, to renew his uh, entire embodiment. Because what we're looking at here uh, is an example of extended embodiment. So, you know, the entire office becomes an extended embodiment of the boss, the extension of his personality, the extension of his masculinity in some sense. So the idea of extended embodiment is sort of manifested or played out or performed by the office space and the gadgets and, 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 and the markets in the office. So I've had it done up lately, uh, he expla explained as he has explained to the past, uh, for the past how many weeks. And now he's going to show up new carpet and appointed to the bright red carpet uh, with a pattern of large white rings. New furniture and he nodded towards the massive bookcase uh, with it on a table with legs that twisted trickle. Electric heating. He waved almost exultantly towards the five transparent pearly sausages glowing so softly in the tilted copper pan. So new heating, uh, you know, um, electric heating would look like sausages uh, being in a heated in a tilted copper pan. He has a new carpet. He has got a new massive bookcase. So again, all these become, as I mentioned, examples of his extended embodiment. It's like a prosthetic thing for the boss, right? So that that manifests his masculinity in a very big way. But, and there's a but coming in, but he did not draw old Woodyfield's attention to the photograph off on the table of a grave looking boy in uniform standing in one of those, <coughs> excuse me, spectral photographer's parks with photographer's storm clouds behind him. That's the one object that Woodyfield is not, uh, you know, directed to. <coughs> there is an old photograph of a boy in uniform, presumably a soldier's uniform. And there is a spectral quality about the photograph, a ghostly quality, if you will. So the word spectral appears already in one of those spectral photographer's parks with the photographer's storm clouds behind him. Uh, and it's a photo of a grave looking boy. So the, you know, it's grave, it's serious, it's spectral. And the word grave can also be a play between seriousness and death, as we know. Uh, the grave uh, where one is buried. Uh, and of course, the, the, the spectrality of it makes the, the deadness of the whole idea, the whole reading, uh, more pervasive. Uh, the spectral photographer sparks with the photographer's storm clouds behind them. So, storm clouds coming in from behind. It was not new. That photograph we are told is not new. It had been there for over six years. Right? So, again, the, the timeline is important over six years. So, you know, presumably. This is, a son, this is the photo of the son and the boss's own son. We don't know at this point in the story, but we're told that uh, there's a photo of a boy in the uniform, very grave looking, in a photographer's park, which is very spectral in quality. And we're also told that this photograph was not new. It had been there for over six years. There was something I wanted to tell you, said old Woodyfield, and his eyes grew dim remembering. And now, what was it? I had in my mind when I started out this morning. His hands began to tremble and patches of red showed above his bed. So Woodyfield confesses he has something in his mind he wanted to tell the boss. But now he can't, uh, he, he's not able to remember it, uh, apparently. So he's trying to put together, stitch together memory, but he's not coming to his mind. But he remembers that he had forgotten. He said, you know, there's something that I had in mind when I started out this morning, which I wanted to tell you, but I now can't remember. For the life of me, I can't remember. So the first, uh, <clears throat> Example of loss of memory comes at this point in the story. Woodyfield is exhibiting a memory loss. He is not able to say something which he wanted to say to the boss. So memory loss. He's, he's not able to remember. 
right? And we, we, we're given a motor movement of his lack of memory, the motor movement of his failing memory. We are told that his hands began to tremble and patches of red showed above his bed. So he's, he's straining himself to remember. He's making an effort at a very bodily motor level uh, to remember, but he's unable to do it. Okay, <coughs> his hands began to tremble and patches of red showed above his bed. Poor old chap, he's on his last pins, thought the boss. Uh, and feeling kindly, he winked at the old man and said jokingly. So again, look at the patronizing gaze the boss has over here. It's very condescending, very patronizing. He said, oh my God, this poor boy, poor man is on his last pins. He's almost dying. He's on the last lap uh, of his life. So, you know, he feels kind, and the, but this kindness, this benevolence, it's obviously very patronizing. It's very patronizing benevolence. He's, he's, he's feeling kind because he feels so superior compared to what you feel. It's a kindness you exhibit towards someone who is way inferior, who is never going to be a threat. Uh, that, that kind of benevolence when you are sympathetic, when you want to feel a bit superior, when you want to feel more strong, more powerful, and then you decide to be kind and you, know, you bail out a person. And feeling kindly, he winked at the old man and said jokingly, I'll tell you what, I've got a little drop of something here that'll do you good before you go out into the cloud, into the cold again. It's beautiful stuff. It wouldn't hurt a child. He took up, uh, obviously the allusion is to alcohol. He, he's going to give Woodyfield some, um, some drink and say, okay, I'm going to give you a little drop of something before you go out in the cold again. And, and um, it's good stuff. It wouldn't hurt a child. So again, the child image comes back. We, we, we know already the Woodyfield is constantly equated with infantilizing metaphor, baby in a pram. Uh, a child, you know, someone who can't control his own motor movements, etc. So at a very motor body level, his lack of agency is very, very clearly manifested. But, you know, this is the point of the story where the boss is trying to feel superior, so he's trying to be kind, he's trying to give something to Woodyfield. Okay, <clears throat> he took a key off his watch chain, unlocked a cupboard below his desk and drew forth a dark squat bottle. So he's brought out an alcohol bottle. That's the medicine, said he. And a man from whom I got it told me on a strict QT that it came from the cellars at Windsor Castle. So, you know, it's a very privileged drink. It came from the cellars at Windsor Castle. The man who sold it to me told me very confidentially, right, uh, that it came from the Windsor Castle. The Windsor Castle obviously became a mar marker of royalty, marker of privilege, marker of luxury. It came from there. So, obviously, it, it's a carrier of that royalty. It becomes a marker, a signifier of that royalty. The cellars at Windsor Castle. Okay. <clears throat> Old Woodfield's mouth fell open at the side. He couldn't have looked more surprised if the boss had produced a rabbit. It's like magic to Woodfield. The boss almost like, it's almost like pulling a rabbit from a hat. The very, very uh, common trope of, uh, of magic, of magicians. So Woodfield is so uh, astonished. Uh, he's completely uh, flabbergasted, he's fascinated. He's so astonished that he's so, so surprised that he you know, almost like the boss has performed a magic trick in front of him. It's whiskey, aren't it? He piped feebly. So there's a whiskey bottle. The boss had produced the whiskey bottle and now he's offering whiskey to Woodyfield as an act of kindness, but you know, benevolent kindness, patronizing kindness, etc. The boss turned the bottle and lovingly showed him the label. Whiskey it was. <clears throat> Do you know, said he, peering up at the boss wonderingly, they, w they won't let me touch it at home and looked as though he was going to cry. So again, uh, if you take a look at the embodiment of Woodyfield is very petulant, is very childish, is very infantilized, almost complaining to the boss. They didn't you know I'm back at home, my wife and the girls, they wouldn't let me even touch it. Um, you know, and you know, and he's about to cry, he's complaining. He's so full of um, you know, self-pity that he's a pathetic character and the pathetic quality has been manifested you know, over and over again. Uh, he's infantilized, he's pathetic, he's decadent, he's almost senile. Uh, and he's complaining about his wife and daughters. He's telling the boss, hey, you know, they treat me so badly at home, they wouldn't let me touch whiskey at all. And look as though he's going to cry. Ah, that's where we know a bit more than the ladies, cried the boss. Again, um, the very sexist statement becomes obvious over here. The boss is saying, hey, those are just women. What do they know about whiskey? Um, we know more than them. It's all about medical things, it's a male knowledge. That's where we know a bit more than the ladies. Right? So, you know, just drink it down and I'm giving you this as a superior man and you're a man, so man up and drink it. So the very manly, uh, the very masculine quality of the rhetoric is important for us to observe, observe and unpack. So that's what he said. <coughs> that's where we know a bit more than a ladies, cried the boss. Swooping across for two tumblers that stood on the table, 
uh, with a water bottle and pouring a generous finger into each. So and the movement again is very agile. He's swooping across the table, getting two tumblers and producing whiskey into it. So it's very, very agile. It's very, the mobility is very, very seamless, smooth. Uh, so the motor movement of the boss uh, is at this point of the story, the motor movement of the boss is, uh, is, is compatible to his financial movement, his financial agency, his external embodiment, extend up, etc. So the external embodiment manifested by the Financial Times, by the new furniture, the new bookcase, electric heating, lovely office, that and the embedded movement, the embedded embodiment about moving in a position with agility, with freedom, with flamboyance, uh, that too is manifested by the boss <coughs> and is pouring uh, whiskey into each tumbler. Drink it down, it'll do you good and don't put in the water with it. It's sacrilege to tamper with stuff like this, so just drink it neat. Uh, drink the neat whiskey, don't pour any water into it. Uh, be again, the water becomes an example of dilution, so drink the neat whiskey, it's a manly thing, drink it down. Uh, the wife and daughters wouldn't know, they don't know about these things, etc. So the whole idea, the whole action, the whole rhetoric is very masculine in quality, in a very sexist way. Okay. <clears throat> ah. He tossed off his, uh, pulled out his handkerchief, hastily wiped his moustaches and cocked an eye at old Woodyfield, who was rolling his in his chaps. So Woodyfield was shivering, trembling and still drinking the whiskey, whereas the boss just drank it down like a manly man, like an agile man, like um, a man in control of his motor movements. Okay. <clears throat> the old man swallowed, was silent a movement, uh, silent a moment and then said faintly, it's nutty, it's good, but it warmed him. It crept into his chill old brain, he remembered. So now he remembers what he wanted to tell the boss. So the whiskey gets into his brain, it has a chemical reaction, it, it sort of makes him more excited, uh, it triggers his memory. Um, okay, so now he remembers. That was it, he said, heaving himself out of his chair. So now he's about to leave, but he remembers and he's going to deliver the statement before he goes away. <clears throat> I thought you'd like to know. Uh, the girls were in Belgium last week having a look at poor Reggie's grave and they happen to come across the boys. They're quite near each other it seems. So again, the reference over here uh, for the first time is about the boys, um, uh, the boss's son's grave. Uh, Reggie presumably is Woodyfield's son. Uh, but notice how the boss is unnamed and so is the son. So the boss becomes the everyman in some sense, the, the, the hegemonic male, the hegemonic authority, uh, masculine authority, uh, the, the patriarchal figure, the patriarch, the grand patriarch. Uh, so he's at the Grand Patriarch, so the stereotype, the archetypal uh, patriarch, so he's unnamed uh, in the story. And the son obviously is uh, one who's supposed to take over the patriarchy, the one who's supposed to take over the chains of command. Okay, so <clears throat> he's also unnamed, so that's like a symbolic statement of how patriarchy flows over time, how the chain of command works uh, in a masculine system, right? And everyone's, everyone else who's outside this chain of command are all named, okay? Uh, so unlike most stories, uh, uh, nameability doesn't uh, acquire agency. So you're given a name because they're not important. You're not given a name because you are the important person, right? You have agency, so you don't require a name. So it's like a reversal of how the naming logic normally works. In normal naming logic, if you get a name, you have identity, agency, etc. If you don't have a name, you don't have those. It's an absence of agency. In this story, however, the absence of the name is a marker of agency. You are the boss. You don't require a name. You are the grand patriarch. You don't require the name. Likewise, a son who's supposed to take over and become an ex patriarch too doesn't have a name because he doesn't require a name. Everyone else has names. Okay. <clears throat> so what do you feel is telling the boss now? You know, the girls were in Belgium. His wife and his daughters were in Belgium last week, having a look at Reggie's grave, and they happened to come across your boys. They're quite near each other, it seems. <clears throat> or would you feel pause? But the boss made no reply. Only a quiver in his eyelids showed that he had heard. The girls were delighted with the way the place is kept, piped the old, old voice, beautifully looked after. Couldn't be better if they were at home. We have not been across, have we? No, no. For various reasons, the boss had not been across. Now, this is the point in the story where you know, it becomes complicated. Uh, so would you feel, a description of would you feel, um, the way he's describing the whole passage, the whole idea, the whole experience. It's very uh, touristy, and as some of you know, uh, this example of trauma tourism, uh, where you know people go to the sites of loss, where they have lost their beloved ones, where they've lost their members of family, right? And uh, <clears throat> the whole idea of traveling, the whole idea of traveling to those places, uh, you know, it was a big boom 
to the tourist industry and the tourism industry uh, post First World War, where trauma tourism became a big deal, and in, in Europe especially, where people travel across countries to take a look at, uh, you know, where their sons and daughters, sons mostly, lost their lives and were, were buried. You know, so the whole idea of traveling to the site of burial, the whole idea of traveling to the site of loss, became a very big public movement, uh, public activity, <coughs> a public activity in the story. And obviously, it's a reflection of the cultural condition at that time. Trauma tourism as a public activity, uh, the public activity of trauma. When you go out and you sort of perform trauma by traveling to the person, uh, to the site of your loss. Okay, uh, and you know, the description is very touristy, as I mentioned. The girls were delighted with the way the place is kept. Said the, by the old voice, uh, beautifully looked after. Couldn't be better. If they were at home, you haven't been across, have you? So he's not asking the boss. You haven't been across. You haven't traveled to that place, have you? No, no, for various reasons, the boss had not been across. So there's a very great quality in this particular passage. For various reasons, the boss had not been across. So, you know, the reasons are not spelled out. Um, there may be something secret, there may be something personal. For various reasons, the boss had not been uh, across. So, <clears throat> you know, there's almost a sinister quality about uh, that, that passage. You know, why we almost, we, we invited to ponder, we invited to explore, investigate, uh, speculate. Uh, why the boss, you know, hadn't been across? Why had he not travelled to the sites of loss? Okay. The miles of it uh, quavered old Woodyfield. Is all as neat as a garden. So again, the the embellishment is important for Woodyfield. Is all as neat as a garden. There are miles of it. So you know, look at the very loaded way in which this uh, this particular information is delivered. There are miles and miles of graves, so which obviously suggests there are so many people who di who died in the war who were buried in that graveyard. There are miles and miles of it. But the way it's delivered, the way it's described, it almost becomes like a Disneyland-like thing. It's so beautiful, it's so natural, it's so uh, lovely uh, in, in terms of its maintenance. And it's very manicured quality about death becomes important. It's manicured uh, death, it's manicured burial uh, ground, it's manicured graveyard, and everything is very manicured and embellished. Uh, it's beautifully looked after. Uh, it's so spotless, it's so lovely, it's so touristy. And you know, the description of the garden is important because the garden is obviously a manicured uh, botanical space uh, compared to a forest. Uh, a forest is non manicured, a forest is wild, it's natural, it just grows. Uh, whereas garden is something that is monitored, uh, it's monitored and manicured. Uh, it's, a, it's a piece of nature which is a manicured piece of nature, it's all as neat as a garden. The neatness becomes important for Woodyfield rather than the vastness of death. The neatness of death becomes important, okay? And that's obviously in correspondence to trauma tourism where it becomes more touristy. The gaze is more touristy rather than, you know, traumatic. So the way you're looking at the whole site becomes a very touristy kind of a gaze. <clears throat> Flowers growing on all the graves, nice broad parts. So, you know, nice broad parts, lovely maintenance, beautiful looked after, spotless, etc. It was plain from his voice how much he liked a nice broad path. So again, the nicety of it, the pleasantness of it, uh, the embellishment of it become more important for Woodyfield. <clears throat> the pause came again, uh, then the old man uh, brightened uh, wonderfully. So again, Woodyfield is brightening up now, Woodyfield is um, uh, getting more and more animated, is getting more, you know, lifelike, is waking up in some sense, it's not really a frail old figure and a muffler anymore, whereas the boss has become silent, as you can notice, not saying anything at all. <clears throat> Do you know what the hotel met the girls pay for a pot of jam? <clears throat> uh, he piped, ten francs, robbery, I call it. It was a little pot, so Gertrude says, no bigger than a half crown, <clears throat> and she hadn't taken more than a spoonful when they charged her ten francs. So again, the whole conversation, the whole discourse becomes about the hotel, it's about jam, it's about the price of jam. It's like a <coughs> tourist coming back from somewhere and giving a lowdown, a description uh, from a purely touristy point of view. Uh, so the gaze again is very, very touristy. It's not uh, traumatic at all. He struck with the price of jam in Belgium. So he's saying, you know, they made her pay 10 francs for a little pot of jam, which is no more than a half crown. Robbery, I call it. So again, the, the complaint, the entire sentiment over here becomes a touristy sentiment. It's hardly uh, a mourning sentiment. It's hardly the sentiment of a mourner. The rhetoric is touristy, the sentiment is touristy, the gaze is very touristy, etc. Robbery, I call it. It was a little pot, so Gertrude says. No bigger than a half crown. And she hadn't taken more than a spoonful when they charged her 10 francs. Gertrude brought the pot back away to, with her to teach them a lesson. So, you know, because they were charging her, they were being a thug, so she also outdid them. So she brought the whole pot back because she paid for it. Quite right, too. 
it's trading on our feelings. So, you know, again, the whole idea of trade becomes more important than the feelings. It's trading on our feelings. So they are making us pay. It's commodification of our feelings. Everything has been commodified. But then the point is, we already know that in Willie Field's mind, the whole idea of commodification has already happened. Uh, it's manicured, uh, it's controlled, everything is like beautifully looked after as a touristy thing, etc. So the whole idea of trauma tourism is manifested. So uh, conspicuously in Woodfield sentiments, he's talking about the jam price, talking about the lovely broad parts. Uh, it's like a garden path, it is so manicured, so controlled, uh, it is so well taken care of. It's like a, it's been a tourist going to Belgium and is taking a look around. And then like a proper tourist is also complaining about the price of different things. So he's coming back and talking about the jam, the price of jam, rather than showing any sentiment of mourning, you know, that's completely disappeared from his mind. So he's talking the entire, the focus, the, the focal point in this particular description is a touristy focal point where he's talking about the jam price, the nice broad parts, the garden-like quality of the graveyard, etc. right? <clears throat> So it's trading on our feelings, right? They think because we are over there having a look around, we're ready to pay anything. That's what it is. And it turned towards the dirt, right? So, you know, they're, they're robbing us, they're giving us, they're dishing out the whole thing. So you can look at the way in which uh, uh, post First World War, and you know, those of you interested in, in trauma studies and tourism studies would know that after the First World War, it was a very big boom in the tourism industry. Some of the uh, tourism companies that we know of today, for example, Thomas Cook. They really blossomed after the First World War for precisely this reason, where people would just travel to different parts of the world to take a look at their you know, dead sons. And most occasions, these people would be old people, uh, the survivors, uh, the surviving parents, or uh, the woman, the wife, and the children, the daughters, etc. And not really um, you know, adventurous men. So they would be dependent on these tourism companies to take them around uh, as a group. Uh, as this group of mourners looking around buying jam, etc. So this little passage really is a very culturally loaded passage where it's talking about the price of jam, it's talking about the beautiful way in which the uh, graveyard is kept, obviously maintained, so presumably you have to pay a ticket to get in. It's like getting in an amusement park, right? So this whole idea of uh, converting uh, trauma into tourism, the whole idea of converting trauma into trade uh, is manifested very clearly in this particular passage. Uh, where he says, they think we're over there having a look around, uh, we are ready to pay anything, you know, it's the payment thing becomes more important, the commodity thing becomes more important, that's what it is. And it turned towards the door, so he's about to leave. <clears throat> quite right, quite right, cried the boss. Though what was quite right, he hadn't the least idea. Now, we're taking a very interesting reversal over here. Woodfield seems to be in control about what he's saying. He's controlling his rhetoric, he's controlling his statement, he's controlling his logic, he's delivering a sentence, he's talking about things in a properly logical, uh, agentic way. Whereas the boss uh, is at a loss of words, so he doesn't quite know what to say. So he's just saying, quite right, quite right. Uh, although we are told what was quite right, he hadn't the least idea. So he's beginning to fall into pieces now. Uh, he's moving away from the stout, rosy figure in control of things. Now he's sort of moving away, he's not really in control of things anymore. So what was quite right, he hadn't the least idea. He came round by the desk, uh, following the shuffling footsteps of the door, and saw the old fellow out. Woodyfield was gone, so Woodyfield's disappeared. Now, the, the purpose of Woodyfield is very interesting in the story. So, despite being a seemingly insignificant figure, he, he does several things. He promotes the superiority of the boss. He serves as a contrast to the masculinity embodied by the boss. And also, he brings in the idea of trauma and how trauma has been diluted into something touristy. Right, so he delivers that message to the boss and then it disappears. So he becomes a very, very uh, important character, a very, very in interesting presence in this particular story. So we'll stop at this point today, what if it was gone? And this is the point of reversal in the story where things will just turn the, uh, upside down. Everything will be reversed. Uh, so the story at the beginning had a certain kind of architecture. Uh, which we now realize was a very deceptive architecture. Now the entire reversal will take place and it will become very complex at a psychological level, which we'll study in subsequent lectures. So we'll stop at this point today. We'll continue this uh, in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.